have to worry about all that. Well, if you didn't know by uh, the, the, the songs that we sang to, today so far in worship, see if you could tell by the sermon title what the subject of my sermon is going to be about. Don't you like it when I get creative with my sermon titles? <laughs> Try to figure them out. All right, here's four scriptures that I want to tie in about this subject of freedom. First one's from Isaiah. And it reads, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. And then John 8. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. In Galatians, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And then Jesus, too, talking to his disciples and those followers, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, most of us are familiar with these verses. They're great verses. They're powerful verses. We memorize them because we revel in the idea that freedom is such an amazing place to be. I'm sure if you could ask any former slave or any former prisoner of war, they tell you that every day they dreamt of the day of their freedom. And for many of them, holding to the hope of one day being set free is what actually kept them alive or kept them sane. Freedom is such a remarkable experience. And I'm not sure if we as Americans can appreciate the depth of freedom quite like people of other nations who were at one time held captive or dominated by foreign enemies. I think to appreciate freedom to the fullest, one would have to know what suppression or oppression first feels like. However, freedom, irregardless of how one receives it, has to be one of the most exhilarating feelings that there truly is. I remember being driven off to college my freshman year by my parents, and after taking everything up to the dorm, my dorm room, and then after my parents left, freedom. <laughs> I'm on my own. Just the idea of me being released from parental control, not that I was ever oppressed in my household or anything like that, but things like curfew and when and what I eat or when and how long I sleep. Making all those decisions by myself gave me the feeling of total independence. It was a pretty exciting feeling. Of course, you know, during the next four years, I never did anything my parents wouldn't have approved of anyway when I was in college. So that's just in case, Mom, you're watching this particular. <laughs> okay, so in these scripture verses that we just read, what was it Yahweh was saying to Isaiah about opening eyes and freeing captives from prison? And what was Jesus telling the Jews? When you know the truth, it will set you free. And what was it Paul was writing to the Galatians? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. I mean, what, what freedoms are they, are they talking about? Freedom from what? What did Isaiah mean by release from dungeons, people who sit in darkness? Obviously, the use of the words prison and dungeon and darkness are all analogies. As physical entities, they represent spiritual principles. Much of the word of God is to be understood analogically, symbolically. We, being physical beings with natural minds, we understand things that are visible, tangible, concrete. If we see it, and we can hold it, then we can better make sense of it. Jesus so often gave his disciples and followers teachings about real life using physical examples. He did it so that those listening could make a spiritual connection. The parable of the sower wasn't about some Jerusalem farmer that went around the countryside dropping down seeds. The parable of the workers in the vineyard it wasn't about people getting paid the same amount of money no matter when they started to work. The light and darkness that Jesus spoke about isn't actual light and darkness. The sheep and the goats, nothing to do with farm animals. New wine and old wineskins, 
Wine was not the subject of that message. The lost pearl, the lost coin, the one lost sheep, all three were representing people. The prisons and dungeons and darkness of today's scriptures are all being used to represent the spiritual oppression that so many people are under. That's why I wanted to talk about freedom today. The freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. For those who have eyes that see, there is incredible liberty in knowing Christ. Take a look at John 8 again. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And if you're my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay, so exactly what is Jesus talking about here? Well, there were a number of Jews in Jerusalem who believed in Jesus, but they had no clue what it meant to be free. True that the Romans were physically and emotionally oppressing the people of God there, but this freedom Jesus was speaking about had nothing to do with Caesar, had nothing to do with his oppressive army. You see, approximately 1,500 years before this, after delivering his people out of bondage in Egypt, God gave Moses the law. And I want to preface this whole thing with this. The law that God gave Moses was and still is a beautiful thing. Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love thy law. The law that God gave to Moses was not a list of rules and regulations to meticulously follow and keep people in line. It was not a way for someone to become holy or righteous. It was not something to follow, to get on God's good side. The law was given not to point out 613 steps to salvation, not at all, but it was given to man to show man his need for salvation to ultimately lead man to the source of our salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. In the law, God revealed himself. See, before the law, people had a difficult time relating to who God was, his holiness, his righteousness, his, his perfection. So to help the people understand more about who their God was, he gave Moses the law to give to the people, and in it revealed the sacredness the infallible goodness and perfect justice of God. Obedience to God's law was to help man become more productive, safer, healthier. Included in God's law were some practical ways for just living a better life, such as dietary laws that God gave to the people. God was building for himself a people here now who would represent him to the world. God needed to teach his people about who he was so that they could best represent him to the world. And then God included in this, in this law sacrificial laws regarding what to do with sin. God needed to teach his people just how serious he was about sin. The sacrificial laws were given to ultimately point to the one-day sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But over time, what happened, as oh, it usually is when God gives man something, was a perverting of God's law. See, man began to view God's law as his personal pathway to holiness. Hmm. If this is who God is, and I do everything that God is, then I can be holy like God. No different from what the serpent told Adam and Eve in the garden, is it? Take a look. Serpent said, oh, you will not surely die. Serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Ah, oh, the pride of the flesh. Listen, our call as the people of God is undoubtedly to be holy people, to live holy lives. Peter said, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I, God, am holy. But holiness is not earned through living by the law or following the Ten Commandments, which is obviously part of the law. Holiness is not a process that we go through by adhering to biblical principles. Follow this and this and that 
And don't forget the one over there. And you're well on your way to personal holiness. No. Holiness is not gained. Holiness is not earned. It's imputed. 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom for God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Christ is our, is our righteousness and, and our holiness. Outside of him, righteousness does not exist. You realize that? And you know, Paul spoke often about boasting. And it's because he had a lot of experience in boasting before he met Jesus. And what he meant here was, if, I, if following the law can make us holy, then man's natural inclination will be to be prideful of it. And then start comparing his holiness with the holiness of others. You can't help that. And look what comparing ourselves to others does. We will either covet the holiness of our neighbor, or we will look down on our neighbor as someone not as holy as we are. In other words, <laughs> that law that was given to point us to God and point out our sin and our ultimate need for God actually became a source of pride and self-righteousness, which are sins. See, man used God's law to covet and then judge. Man turned God's law basically, into a source of sin. Can you see why God became so frustrated with his people? They took something he intended as, as holy and perfect and just, and they turned it into a pathway to sin. It led him to tell the prophet Isaiah this. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? says the Lord, I have more than enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Whew. Wow. You know, God gave these people sacrifices. He wanted them to follow them. Again, not as a means for personal holiness, but as a reminder of what God has done for them and to point to a future time when he will offer once for all time the sacrifice of the perfect lamb of God. Hebrews. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. See, in Isaiah's day, the people should have come with their sacrifices out of gratitude. They should have come out of thanksgiving. Instead, they came out of a feeling of obligation and a means for holiness. So, if I don't bring this ram to the temple and sacrifice it, I won't be as holy as I should be and God won't be pleased with me. That's called obligatory sacrifice. It's the last thing that God wants from any of us. Ask yourself, now do you drop your tithe and offering in that box back there with the attitude of joy and a mindset of thankfulness, thinking how grateful and blessed you are that God is allowing you to keep 90% of all he has given you? Or do you begrudgingly write out your weekly check thinking, you know, there's a lot of other things I could be doing with this money, but then... God will be displeased with me and I wouldn't be doing my part as a good little Christian. If that or something even remotely close to that is your mindset, you're off, you're better off doing anything else with your money. Because God is saying to you this, stop bringing meaningless offers. The offerings are meaningless because of the attitude with which we bring them. God looks at the heart. 
Listen, does God still want us sacrificing today? You bet he does. Paul wrote to the Romans, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. But our sacrifice, whatever it is, must be motivated by a grateful and a thankful heart. Do we do what we do for, for God out of love, out of thanksgiving? Or do we do what we do for God to maintain our Christian standing? The Jews in Jesus' day were embracing the Mosaic Law purely, purely as a means for earning pious standing, getting in good with God. They believed that they had to follow it for fear of God getting upset with them. They failed to see the love that he revealed in his law, because it's there. Instead, they saw his law as this exhaustive list of things to follow, so as not to make him angry, because God is such a tyrant, and he can't wait to catch us not following one of his laws. Put yourself in that position. Here, 613 commandments that was written in Scripture. Put yourself in that position. 613 of these commandments that you think you're expected to follow, jot and tittle. 613 commandments that you were never intended to live by. No. Every day you go about your life in fear of slipping just on one of them. Oh, for fear that God would somehow punish me. No. Imagine the anxiety of having to live your entire life like that. Worry that, did I slip up? Is God mad? Is God angry? Right? We, that was Job's mindset. He, he, he thought he had a target on his back, and God was just waiting for him to mess up so he could, he could you know, hit him with another disease or sickness or something. Think of it. Every day, you wake up, starting out in defeat. Here I go again. You start climbing this gigantic mountain, right? You wake up in the morning and you know it's going to, that can't be a good day because, so, here we go. I got to put all these here, 600 and, not only 613 commandments that you got to live by every day. You, you, you take two steps forward and you take two steps back, you get nowhere. This is what I got to do, this is who I got to be. Right? That, that's, that's not who our God is. And not only that, but add to these 613 commandments that enter the Pharisees here, and the scribes, and the teachers of the law. Right? They, 613 wasn't good enough for them. So what they did was they took all 613 and started adding to every one of them. Right? We got that on uh, if, uh, Exodus 20, right? The, we've read this before talking about how, what God says about the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to your Lord your God. They took that and began heaping. They, listen, they wrote 10 full pages of what it meant not to do work on the Sabbath. So here's what they did. Brandon's going to help me. One of them was that a woman could not wear a brooch on the Sabbath because that was actually making her do more work, walking around with such a heavy brooch on her. Just jot and tittle these little tiny things that they started adding on, making the people, so there's that one. So they're adding bricks, right, to the lives of, of God's people by heaping all these, all these laws. Jesus and his disciples they were walking through a wheat field on the Sabbath, right? They were hungry, they hadn't, hadn't eaten it. And they just grabbed down and pulled some wheat off the stalks and ate it, condemned. Because you weren't allowed to, weren't allowed to pick wheat. That's, that's working on the Sabbath day. There were so many things that they continued to add, heaping up. Put, put another one in there just for, just for the good of it. So here they are. This is heavy, right? But this is who we are when we think we have to live our lives by the law. 
You know, the Pharisees, that's modern day legalists. And, and don't think it's not prevalent today in the thinking of man because it is. Right? Can I get up here? Yeah, I can make it. It's sad. It's really, truly sad. It's heartbreaking to see people living their lives under the law. There were literally hundreds, if not thousands, of these man-conceived amendments added to God's laws by the Pharisees. And they were watchdogs of every one of them. They would shame the people. They would heap on the backs of all God's people all of these things. Take a look. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They tie up heavy loads and they put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. You know what the saddest part of all this is? Which is true then and is still true today. They put the law of Moses above the worship of Almighty God. You know, there are people that worship their religion ahead of worshiping Almighty God. It's no different. Remember then in God's preface to the Ten Commandments, he said this, I am the Lord thy God which have brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. See, in saying this, Jehovah reminded Israel the very purpose of the law was to make them and to set them free. This is where legalism in the church got its start. And unfortunately, the trend continues today. You see, there's no Greek word for legalism in Scripture, so Paul uses the phrase works of law. Here's what he wrote to the Romans. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by Legalism, by the works of the law, rather through the law we become conscious of our sin. We wouldn't even know what sin is, if, if not for the law, to point it out. And then to the Galatians, know that a person is not justified by legalism, by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law... No one will be justified. As I said, the trend of legalism or the works of law continues to be taught and encouraged in churches today. It's done for one reason, to suppress and control the people. It's why the Pharisees did it. And it's why the, relig the religious establishment still does it today. If we tell people they're free to do whatever, no one will follow God. So now here's what we do. We'll get them afraid to sin by telling them how angry God gets when they sin. And then we'll tell them he'll turn his back on them until they're able to make it up to him. We'll put the fear of God in them. Well, the fear of God isn't to be afraid of God. It's to have a holy reverence for God. Look. Look. Here's how legalism, which is really slavery to the law, works. If I disobey God and sin, God becomes displeased with me, and I have to earn back God's favor by proving myself worthy. In Jesus' day, that meant taking another sacrifice to the temple, burning incense or burning grain, whatever. Today, it can mean doing more and more and more pious-looking things. God will be pleased. The more I do, the God will be more pleased. Legalism teaches if I sin then I have to make a concerted effort to pray more, study more scripture, make an effort to get to church on time. I won't curse. I won't lust. I won't allow the, my anger to get the best of me. And then I promise, hopefully, it'll, it'll get me back again in the good graces of God, and now he'll be pleased with me once again. All well and good, but what happens tomorrow when two of your promises are broken? Because you and I both know they'll be broken. If not tomorrow, they'll be broken the next day. So now, now look, I got to do more now. I got to do, I, I, I got to put forth more effort, pray more, read more scriptures. Stop it! Really? Come on. Don't you see it's nothing but a vicious cycle? That never ends. Because as long as we're in this body of flesh, we are going to sin. 
And under legalism, what that means is we'll ever, forever find ourselves in God's spiritual doghouse. The devil loves it when we put ourselves, and that's what we do. The devil loves it when we put ourselves in God's spiritual doghouse. Because when we're there, you know what? It's impossible to experience God's unconditional love when we're there. It's impossible to know his amazing grace when we're there or even experience this, this freedom that he has given us. The devil can't stand to see people get set free. There's no way. So we get heaped on with self-condemnation, guilt, hmm, shame. Those are the things that are yoking and binding so many people today. Because they're still attempting to live under the law. Jesus came to set the captives free from guilt, self-condemnation, and from shame. Once again, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Jesus came to take all those people who think their behavior and their adherence to such things as the Ten Commandments. Listen, if I hear that one more time, all i got to do is follow the Ten Commandments. Well, there's 613 laws. So you got 603 more that you got to deal with, right? I'll be good if that's all I need to do. That'll make me right with God if I follow those. That means I'll earn His favor. No, Jesus came to open the eyes of people that thought like that. Because, you see, his amazing grace is far greater, more powerful than any sin or any disobedience on my part. Shame is nothing more than spiritual shackles, self-condemnation, spiritual incarceration. The more you heap that upon yourself, the deeper entrenched you get into slavery. The religion of man can so often teach us that. It's all about following all the rules and regulations. But the catch-22 there is nobody can do it. It's all lies. And they're being taught by religious institutions calling themselves God's church. Just do more, work a little harder, ask for more forgiveness, more Forgiveness. You know, Reed, I, I really hope God has forgiven me. You, you're hoping? Really? Don't you want to know? Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have. Say we have. Yes. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Have you received God's forgiveness through the blood of Jesus? Yes? Okay. Then you're forgiven. And listen, you're forgiven past, you're forgiven present, and you're forgiven future. But pastor, shouldn't I ask for forgiveness every time I sin? Sure. I mean, if you want to. Go ahead. But because of the crucifixion and because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and your confession of faith in him, it's not necessary because you see, that sin, ha, your father has already forgiven it. This is just another yoke of slavery put on people by religion. Boy, I hope I don't die while I'm sinning because it might not be forgiven. Well, then maybe I'll die in my sin. Oh, no. That's nonsense. Do you really think that's what Jesus came to do for us? You think that's setting us free? Come on. Living under the fear of God, maybe not, or maybe he is forgiving us. But you see, read the things I've done in my life. I, 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 you know, I, I don't deserve to be forgiven. Here we go. No one deserves to be forgiven. That's the beauty of forgiveness. It's what makes grace, grace. It comes to everyone undeservedly. If we deserved it, it would be called payment. Take a look, Romans eleven six. 6. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works, because if it were, grace would no longer be grace. 
This is why people out of the touch of grace can't see God's immeasurable love wrapped up in his grace. They don't know. They're so busy with their heads down, earning his favor, they can't see his love. Grace is the chain breaker. Once we're set free by the blood of Jesus, grace is not the get out of jail free card. No, grace is the never having to go to jail in the first place card. Here's the true definition of freedom. When tempted, I can sin. I can, right? But I choose not to. And when I choose not to, I am proving that sin is not my master. Therefore, I am free. Paul wrote it. Everything is permissible for me. But not everything's beneficial. Everything's permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And when I choose not to give in to temptation, it proves that sin is no longer my master. The world does not have that option. Listen, people of the world think they're free, but they're not. I'm just going to live the way I want to live. Uh, no, you're not. You're going to live the way sin wants you to live. Because, see, sin is your master. You're not free to do as you want. You do what sin wants. The flesh is incapable of mastering sin because sin is stronger than my will and your will, all of our wills. There's only one thing that can master sin. Here it is. You are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by what? The Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, Freedom is also this. If I give in to temptation and I sin, I'm not bound to do something to make it up to God. So does that mean I'm totally off the hook when I sin? Not at all. You know why? Because sin has consequences. My sin might very well cause horrific pain and suffering. And not just for myself, but for others. Sin is destructive. That's why God put such emphasis on our sin. Something had to die to take the place of sin. Yeah, sin has consequences. But sin does not remove me from God's eternal grace. You know, there's some people that say, read no such thing as security of salvation. And here's my reply. So you're telling me that God grants salvation insecurely. What about the people who get saved are now living like heathens? What about them? Yeah, really, what about them? You losing sleep over them? Listen, God's their judge. Right? Not me. So you're telling me that God dangles this gift of salvation over our heads and he waits and and sees if we live our lives deserving of it. How is that any different from advocating that salvation is by works? It's not. It's the same thing. Let me ask you, what did you do to gain salvation? Nothing. That's right. But now you're telling me you've got to do something to keep it? Come on. If that's the case, where God holds salvation over our heads, then every day we're living with the the unknown. Maybe I've done something that God's not going to forgive. And that, my friends, produces one thing. Fear. Look at 1 John. Perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. For there is now no condemnation for those who live in Christ Jesus. It's time to be set free, really. For those that feel as though they have to prove something to God every day and follow all of these 
It's time. Let's get rid of this. Really. Let's get rid of this. This thought process that we've got to earn God's love. We've got to do something to keep God's love. God is just standing there waiting for us to, to mess up. Mm-hmm. If that's your view of God, you have a total wrong view of God. He's a God of love. And he's a God of justice. He is. But he's a God of love. Do you know that love? It's time to be set free because that's exactly what Jesus came to give us. He said it more than once. So if our last scripture, so if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Have you been set free? That's the, that's the question. Have you been set free? If you are set free, then listen. You're free indeed. And if you think that, that God will love you more by being better people, then you're missing his entire point of grace. Embrace grace. That's what we are to do with it. And walk out of here in freedom. Freedom from the, all that, that stupid religion or, or things that you, you, that you were taught or people have told you. Get it out of here. Take his word, embrace it, and live a life experiencing his love. Because that's when you're free. Under the law, you don't know love. You know condemnation. You know shame. Under grace, you know love. Pray with me. Heavenly, most merciful Father, we thank you for your word. Once again, how clear it is to us, how you speak to us, Lord God, in, in such a way that we, we understand. Thank you for using all these, these physical examples to teach us these spiritual principles, Lord God, that do set your people free. May we walk out of here in freedom, embracing it, Lord, and one thing that does when we come to grips with freedom, your freedom, our love for you increases. Our joyfulness, the living each day in this freedom increases. We can be more thankful people knowing that you're not ready to, to hammer us the first time we do something wrong. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving me that much. It's in your precious name that we pray now and forevermore. Amen. amen and amen. Would you stand with me as we continue to embrace this freedom?